Colossians 1, 15 through 20. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before everything else, and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead, so he is first in everything. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ, and through him God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. I, uh, this morning, as Marta has already pointed out, and you've already heard the scripture read of that, that major piece of, of scripture. As she said, it's not a story. Uh, it's, it's the culmination of some pieces. You may notice around me already that I have some props. I love props and teaching with props. One of my favorite sermons of all time that I've ever taught was the use of a prop. It was a story that comes out of the Old Testament in the book of Joshua primarily and how that when God showed them magnificent and wonderful things and had incredible encounters with God, they piled up rocks and said, well, we don't know about the future, but this pile of rocks reminds us of the fact that we know we met God here. Rick reminds me of that sermon often. In fact, thank you, Rick, that occasionally he'll come up and he'll pull out a rock and say, here's my rock to remind me. Today is an illustration. And I did my very best to come up with, a, with an illustrative piece that surrounds me. So bear with me this morning. Even those of you who are online and those of you who are in the room and a good audience in the room as well. But I don't want you to be an audience. I want you to be students, has been already pointed out to you. But with this picture around you, many of you in the room were given a a document, uh, a piece of paper. There's a downloadable document uh, that was put on the website that you can get to, and I'll refer to that in a minute, and you can kind of take notes. I really want you to consider taking notes, and you absolutely are going to be given a test today. But the illustration I wanted to use came out this way, but it started just for fun, just so you know. uh, I was... I had this illustration in my head for weeks about hat rack and how that you come along in life and, you know, you have a belief in something, you sort of hang your hat there. You know that term? You hang your hat here. And I kind of liked that term and I was had this visual. I was going to build a hat rack and we were going to go on. My daughter came and says, don't build a hat rack. And my son-in-law says, you know that old song, Motown song? Well, I've kind of had fun with you last week about the Rolling Stones, and I'm sure you know this song too. That, that song that said, Papa was a Rolling Stone. Wherever he hung his hat was his home. And when he died, all that was left, all he left us was alone. It's a great theological song. The point is, my daughter says, you can move your hat around, you can believe this today, and then you can change hat racks here and there. you got to build a wall. So today, I'm going to build you a wall. I'm going to make an attempt to give you a visual of your life of building a wall. So what we've already been pointed out a couple, two or three times was this verse again that comes out that says Colossians 1.15. It's the memory verse for the whole year. And by the way, the test on the screen of here is the QR code for that. You can download it on your phone. Go on the website, scroll scroll it down. That's how you get this test in your own document and form. And again, I have it in paper form for you. But it's all based upon, again, one more time, the memory verse. And in the NLT, it goes this way. Multiple versions, it says it, but it says it's really the same thing. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He, Jesus Christ, is the visible image of the invisible God. And we've tried to base our entire school year on that 28 sermons plus a series of devotionals during the Advent season of Christmas plus 
a series of devotionals on the week of Passion and Holy Week, the week before Easter. All of these messages, all of these stories, every one of them have been based upon that verse the entire school year. And so that's why we're coming now to this final sermon. And it's not, you know, the be all end all, but it is the final piece of this year's message. And that's why I want to give you a test. Why would I give you a test? Um, it's finals week. Talk to all the college students out there. They will all tell you that <clears throat> right now, either they've just finished or are in the middle of trying to prepare. A, a final. How many of you, I might have already asked it, but how many of you do college finals? Raise your hand in the room. College finals. I don't know about you, but college finals were pretty horrific. And why? Because you had to take the culmination of all the things that were taught in the weeks of study in the classroom, as well as a lot of the take home and the reading and the writing that you had to take care of, so that when you came to the test, they go, did you get this? I've been going to church all my life. I mean, I'm one of those that I was practically speaking born in the church, all right? Not particularly makes me any more noble than anybody else, but just to say that my experiences of being a part of a church life have, have been is absolutely all of my life and as long as I can remember. And my father was also a preacher, pastor, pastor, preacher, and I heard him preach a lot of sermons and then following that, many other people as well in my own life. And in all of my growing up life, I never remember being given a test in church, ever. Took lots of tests in school, but never one in church. And I kind of wondered the other day, why don't we do that? And I know why. It's because we run everybody off if we do, right? All of you would come and say, I'm not coming to church to go to school. Just give me a good lesson to learn. Have something nice to hear about so then I can... Go off and I can feel better and really all you care about is my offering anyway, isn't it? That's the message for the finance team, right? No, the answer is no to that. And I've really struggled with this for a very long time. Why don't we challenge each other? Let's use that term instead of the test. Because I realize the negative connotation around a test. Because most of us, when we took a test, I took Spanish and I passed my final. And I could speak like four words. So I get it that we take a test sometimes and then we just completely disregard that because we've moved on. This test is much more important and it's much more of a challenge because this is like real life stuff. And so kind of as a pastor, I really do want to present to you in this first year of study that we've actually called, it's the first of five years. So if we do this well and do this right, you get four more tests every May for the next four years. <laughs> there was a big whoop in the room if you were online and didn't hear that. You do, you might, you do in heaven. So anyway, actually, we're going to talk about that degree in just a minute, Lewis. But the point of all of that is the fact that I'm really asking you to take this home, take the UR code, take the printed version, put it on your own computer, download it, because the, the answers that you're going to need are going to be far bigger than the spaces that you have on the test itself. But I'm going to give you a month. I want you to turn it in by the end of May. Uh, seriously. So, Lifeways, Year 1, Theology, Life, Test on the Book of Jesus. That's where we're at. I have built a ser whole series of messages all year long. And I'm going to lower this just a little bit so we can make sure that we all see this. When we build our understanding of life, we build it on sort of knowledge about different kinds of pieces. Across this room are bricks, little different shapes and different sizes. And I've tried to help make this make sense to you. But all of us build our lives on something. An, an understanding, sometimes we'll say a brick over here is... Oh, this is my family background. Over here, here's my life skill. Here's really where I want to live, Euphreda. You know, here's where I want to be. Here's where I want to marry. You know, and here's what kind of music I like, Rolling Stones. Here's what, you know, here's my life. 
and I build it up this way. These are my preferences. This is my, that's kind of not really building a brick life. That's like hanging your hat like, you know, Papa was a Rolling Stone. Wherever you lay your hat, well, that's your home today until you change your mind and move on to another one. But the Bible is, a, is an incredible, uh, it's a complete understatement for me to say it's an incredible document. It's literally the Word of God. And by making that statement, we're saying that if you want truth of any kind, that's where you go. And I absolutely believe that. And we absolutely teach that. So what we have to do, before we ever decide who we're marrying and what we're doing for a job and where we're going to live and you know how we're going to vacation and all that stuff, and how we're going to make money and spend money, you have to really have a firm foundation whether you or working in the tech industry, or building airplanes, or you're a farmer, or you're, you know, whatever you are, school teacher, or, you know, soccer player. You have to build this foundation, which is why I'm reminding you again of the entire journey. And so as I build this foundation of rocks, your assignment as your test of your final for year one of the book of Jesus is to take that word or phrase, and over the next two or three weeks, I'm going to have you ask you to flesh this out. Now, fair warning, every one of these words, there are volumes of books written out each one. So don't write that much. But maybe a good strong paragraph on each one. Your life will be transformed if you do this. And I'm serious. Now, many of you are saying, ah, oh, this is, Billy's got a hyperbole here. He's really asking us, there's no way I'm going to do this. In fact, I was discussing this with, with Alvin the other day. And, I said, this is what the test I want to go. And he goes, you realize that probably like 3 to 5% of our church will ever do this. And I go, well, maybe. But I'm begging of you. Press it further than that. Because it's not for me. It's for you. In the theology that we built all year, we started with this theology. And you build like every good house. Ken over here is a builder. And he'll tell you, you build that firm foundation in the best way to build that firm foundation is on the rock. It's literally on the rock. So I went out and bought these to display this to you. And by the way, the scripture here at the Bible is open to Colossians chapter 1. That passage that we've been reading. Because if, if all of the world and all of scripture really is about Jesus, then we start with that truth and we say, how, does that, how do we build that understanding? And so I've got my first brick here. And it is the assignment that you have to talk about the holy God. There is a holy, awesome God that we have talked about back in September that comes out of Genesis chapter 1, the Creator, Almighty, Elohim, El Shaddai, Veliki uh, Bog is how they say it in Russian. That incredible uh, God who is beyond and above all things. And we start there. And your job is to fill the blank and to say, what do we know about the Holy God? What do we, how do we find the Holy God? How do we understand the holiness of God? And again, fair warning, there, you can like, write volumes and volumes and never stop. But in your simplistic fashion, try to write out a paragraph to talk about the Holy God and what a difference that makes. And with every one of these theological words or phrases, it's always the challenge is to say, what does that word mean or that phrase mean, but also what does that do to change my understanding of the world, my worldview, and my understanding of myself. You dig into this deeper and spend the rest of your life doing it, it will transform everything. But we started there with Genesis 1 with the Holy God, and then we also went on to Genesis chapter 2, and we built the brick of the image bearers of man, because the question always people have about themselves is, who am I? And in Genesis 2 it talks about we were created. And we had a message about that back in late September. And we built that brick to say, you are unique. I heard a message just last night on an advertisement that said, really, humanity is just sort of fits in with the rest of the world and you kind of blend in. And my wife, when she heard that, she said, that's just not true. You build a theology like that, it totally will affect your worldview. If you're nothing unique, really, you just sort of, Blend in with the trees in the forest. We are the image bearers of God. There's your second assignment in your theology. But then the third brick of theology understanding that we built this on was the word shattered. 
a word we used over and over and over again, the story that starts out of Genesis 3, and literally what we traditionally call the fall of man, but how that affects us, how that this holy God created the image bearer us to walk in harmony with him, but then all of a sudden we became this shattered humanity in that way. And then we have our fourth assignment on your test, and it's the, and it's the uh, brick of rescue. It's the theological understanding of the rescue of God, which we also start seeing in Genesis chapter 3, 15, when God made a proclamation to humanity and to Satan himself about how he would begin the rescue of the image bearer. You understand where we're going? This is a theological basis of everything. And then we have this next word, a sermon that actually my son-in-law taught when he did uh, back in late fall, and it's the word covenant. God's promise, one of the great, great words of Scripture. God's covenant promise. Again, spend some time looking at that passage. You'll find it initiated in Genesis 12 about Abraham, but it goes way on beyond that throughout scriptures. The more you read your Bible, by the way, I, I put it this way, the more you read your Bible, the more you'll kind of go, wow, now I see it. I mean, literally, as I've been teaching this year these passages, I cannot tell you how many times I've come at this and gone, wow, this is Billy, I'm really learning something. And I'm the one delivering the message. You know, I'm the one supposed to know this. I don't. You never stop learning this stuff. You never stop understanding the foundational truth of this and how it applies. And this covenant word is throughout Scripture, God's promise to say, I'm reaching out to you. And He says, but make a covenant promise back to me. Investigate that. Think about that. And then this incredible word, theologically, as we build this last part of the foundational piece, is the word sacrifice. The word sacrifice. That God says, in the middle of all that, there is a sacrifice that must be made. Why? Because of the shattered humanity has literally been destroyed and he wants to be rescued back to the holy God there's your foundational bottom piece which we spent part of our fall in and then I finished that little fall chapter one series we put them in six chapters by the way if you didn't notice that in our series this year and I love this little brick this super important brick because it's really found in the book of Exodus chapter 12 initially it's also found in Noah's Ark story it's also found in lots and lots of other places but it's the word remember. Never forget. Never forget. There's a rainbow. Never forget. At the Exodus, when, when the, the, the Passover lamb came over, why would they have the Passover festival? Why? Because God says, don't you ever forget. Remember. Why do we take the Lord's Supper? Because we remember. Why do we pray at a meal? Because we're trying to put holy foo-foo dust on the food? We do it because we say, we remember that without you I'm nothing. We're not done, obviously. We keep building the wall. Because what we did is that when God said, all of this foundational piece and this rescue attempt that's on the bottom piece, God came along and said, I'm going to make a promise to you of a coming Messiah. And we primarily locked ourselves, this is now kind of in the Christmas season, the Advent season for our church, we locked ourselves into the stories uh, mostly out of Isaiah and the promise of a son and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, and the government will be on his shoulders. You look at it yourself in Isaiah chapter 9 and there's many other places that you can investigate this, but it's literally the promise of the Messiah, the Savior. And then we kind of investigate that what's the picture of the Messiah? The picture of the Messiah that we investigated many places, not only Isaiah 9, but also Isaiah 49, also Isaiah 53. Don Turner preached a message on Isaiah 53 during the Christmas Advent season that talked about the great sacrifice. So this Messiah, this was to come, this promised one that was to come here, What's, his, what's the picture of what he's to do? He's to fulfill these things, and especially this sacrificial part. Why? 
to rescue and redeem the image bearer person back to the Holy God. You've got to have that theological wall in your mind. And then we have what? Christmas. This is the Christmas block, which we all love Christmas, right? And we see that block of Christmas in Luke chapter 2 and in other places, of course, of Jesus' arrival, the Messiah that was to come. And we build that theological understanding that's found also in John chapter 1, which has really launched the beginning of our study of John this winter, but it kind of found itself on Christmas Eve. And we talked about in John chapter 1 is the great lineage study of the coming Messiah. What's the lineage of this Messiah? The lineage of this Messiah is the Holy God. Is the Colossians 1.15 passage that says Christ is the visible image of the invisible Holy God who arrived in a manger in Bethlehem. But the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. John chapter 1. You see where we're going? We're going to keep building the wall because current, once we turned into uh, the very, very tail end of January and we moved into uh, the month of, uh, oh, into the month of January, we started the, the, the next chapter in our study, which is technically chapter 4 as we kind of lined it out there. In that story, it was the study of the coming Messiah, the Jesus Himself. Now we finally turn over to the four Gospels and in our case, we primarily focused on the book of John, but in the study of that book of John, we decided, let's discover his life. What did he do? Where did he go? How did he live? What did he say? What were the events of his life? And you have this beautiful picture of the fact that the Messiah, Jesus, came first and launched his ministry with three different stories that we dealt with. He started with first his baptism by John the Baptist. And then secondly, his temptations in the desert, in the wilderness. And third, his calling of his disciples. And he launched his life here. And everybody kind of goes, well, now we're into the stories. I'm kind of starting to get a little familiar with those stories. What do they have to do? These have to be built on this if you're going to understand who Jesus is. And so then the next story that we dealt with was Jesus turned water to wine. And so what we have is the picture of the fact that Jesus was a miracle worker. That incredible story. I haven't taught that message back in January. But the point is in that you have to investigate what does this Jesus who is a miracle worker and turn water to wine have to do with any of these other things down here? It's your job for you to investigate. Think clearly. How does that build the storyline? And then we have this beautiful story which we find the, the story of John 3.16 in when Jesus met Nicodemus in John chapter 3. And in that storyline, what we have is the fact that uh, Jesus talked about uh, uh, talked to Nicodemus about you must be born again. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Born again? How do I do that? You must be born again. Flesh is flesh. Spirit is spirit. Remember that message? I taught that message back a while back. But then you build that storyline of Jesus and you come along to the next story. In John chapter 4 when Jesus met a Samaritan woman at the well. And he not only, uh, 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 it, it, great complexity of that story and beautiful piece of that story to accommodate into the fact that, you know, I can give you living water. You can be born again, Nicodemus. I can give you living water. Who? This Messiah. Who's the Messiah? Messiah is this piece underneath here. The Isaiah 9 Messiah. The Isaiah 53 Messiah. The Isaiah 49 Messiah. The Gentile Messiah. The message to the Gentiles. And then we come along and Jesus healed this man down at the pool. And you build that foundational piece there in John chapter 5. When you look at that story and you say, wow, this Jesus, he, was a, he turned water to wine back over here. But now it, what we've seen is he even heals the sick and the lame. And, and, uh, in that way and he is the life in that way so then we build it keep going and we build another piece of the of the rock of the foundational wall and in John chapter 6 when Scott taught Scott my son-in-law taught the message out of John 6 of Jesus feeding the 5,000 you know that fun story he said that's what Jesus we think oh Jesus is supposed to just have bread power bow, 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 bow. 
What is this Jesus who feeds 5,000 with a few, 5,000 really men, it's probably 15,000 people uh, or more, but he fed them with just a few loaves and a few fish. Because he's a, the Savior, the Messiah, who has all things in his reach. But then he ended that chapter in John chapter 6 with what we call the cost of discipleship or the all-in parts of discipleship of what it means to be a follower. You want to follow this Jesus? Yes, he's the healer. Yes, he gives eternal life. Yes, he, he, he gives a living water. Yes, he turns wa water to wine. Yes, he feeds 5,000 people with a few fish. But if you really want to follow him, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood, John chapter 6. Your job and your test is to go back and say, how does this Jesus built on this foundational truth answer the understanding of why God needed to send a Messiah to me? And then we had this fabulous lesson taught to us in John chapter 11, which Don Turner taught that Sunday. One of my favorite messages that I made a comment when he finished and said, I want that sermon preached at my funeral. Just help remember that. So anytime soon, just let, you know, make sure that goes into the will. But the point is, when he talked about I am, you know, John, Lazarus, his friend, died, and I am, and he says, how do we, what do we do, what do we do? And he raised him to life, he says, because I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And then I'm going to finish this layer off, which again, we could build a lot more, because in John chapter 6, John chapter 8, John chapter 10, John chapter 11, John chapter 14. We have this foundational theological truth that is the great I am statements of Jesus. I am the gate. I am the good shepherd. I am the way. I am the vine. I am the truth. I am the life. Your homework is to go and look at every one of those statements that come into those passages and say, how does this Messiah teach us something about God and something about myself when I come to understand these truths? And we're not done. Because what we have is it just keeps going. Then we walked into Easter week and what we call Passion Week or Holy Week. Why would we call it Holy Week? Because of this brick right here. Because this Messiah who was fulfilling this, this line and a lineage back to the holiness of God was about to lay a sacrifice for all of mankind. And so we started Holy Week with Jesus washing of the disciples' feet in John chapter 13. And then we turn to John chapter 14. When he says, I go prepare a place for you. And where I go, you may go also. Where are you going? I am the way, the truth, and the life, he said to Thomas and the disciples. Then we turn to John 15. We talked in that Holy Week, and we had a devotional every night in our church. Every night, out of John 13, John 14, John 15. The John 15 is the I am the vine, you are the branches. We had two devotionals out of John 16 at when, at, uh, that week because we were discussing and talking about these, these errors, this Messiah sacrificial Lamb of God from the holiness of God was about to lay it all down for His humanity. And then we have this incredible passage in John 17, which is Jesus' prayer for who? You read it for yourself in John 17 as he comes along and says, I'm praying for all the disciples to come. You know who that is? It's you. Foundational truth. And again, we can stretch this out a lot further than I'm doing. But then we kindly come to John chapter 18 and we understand Jesus because in John 18 or, or excuse me, 19 eight, or it is 18 in John 18, Jesus came along, and guess what happened? It's now Good Friday. And he was this Messiah from the Holy God who was willing to lay down his sacrificial life, finally gets arrested, taken on trial in a Roman court to the jeers of, of the crowd that hated him. Mostly Jewish at that point, but it's really all of humanity. And said, I will lay it down for you. And he was put on trial, whipped, scarred on his head, and then John 19, or a crown of thorns on his head, and in John 19, they hung him on the cross, and he died. Holy God, shattered, or image bearer man, 
God's rescued attempt, right? Image, image bearer man, the shatteredness of mankind, God's rescue attempt, comes all the way down to the sacrifice that God said, I want to bring you back. And you build this entire wall based upon that. And you're thinking, well, that's just kind of out there theology. We're not done yet because it all affects you. But the story obviously is not over because on Easter Sunday morning, this resurrected Jesus appeared out of the grave after three days. And it transformed everything. And we have spent the last three Sundays kind of unraveling those storylines of the resurrected Christ and how He appeared to humanity. But the most important piece in all that, and of course that subject alone is worth everything in volumes. But the beauty of all of this little wall as we build it in this way is to understand that on top of all of this, it started with the holiness of God and this relationship that we had with Him ends with the complete story of Jesus. This right here, theologically, is where it's all finished. It's all complete. It's done. But then the last sermon or two is really kind of launching us into next year's study, which will start in September. So take this test. You cannot move to year two until you pass year one. That's the rules of Lifeway Church. And you have to double your offering next year if you don't pass. That's a joke, <laughs> right? That's a preacher joke, right? But the last couple of weeks, we've said two famous words that I really love. And one was the word restored. Who's restored? Us. In order to reveal His image. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God, holy God. When we come back into relationship with Him, we get the restored image that we lost at the shattered part of man. And we get to join Him, the Bible says clearly. We literally get to participate. We're not God, not even close. But we are restored back to what we are, even though we're walking in a shattered world to this day, but we're restored and still alive so that we can reveal, which again, I'm going to just say it one more time. This is where we start in September on this foundational piece. So your assignment for the next four weeks, and I'm dead on serious about this, you will benefit, it will benefit your world tremendously if you will walk your way through this, is to fill in the blanks. Try to write a little paragraph. It's not for me. It's really for you. I would like to force you to turn it into me just because that gives you an incentive. Don't write volumes. Try to put it in a paragraph. But the other challenge I want to make is that our small groups that we're finishing out with at this point, or that we, we're trying really hard as a church to say Sundays is the launch of our teaching through children's and youth and everything else, and that ultimately it's going to come out into even adult groups that said and discuss these things and learn from each other. So I want these groups to discuss this and walk their way through and try to fill in the blank. And even to the point where two by two, I would encourage you to sit down with somebody else and say, how do we, what does the holiness of God mean? What does the, the sacrifice of God mean? What does that mean over here when Jesus said, I am the vine, I am the branches? This is not a small test. This is a pretty big deal. And the beauty of it is you can spend the rest of your life kind of building on it. But I'm going to give you a deadline, and that's the end of May. Now, that's why we did what we did this year. To kind of <clears throat> remind you again, our memory verse is, say it with me out loud, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. Now that was easy for you to quote because it's on the screen. I want you to get that in your head, Colossians 1.15, but how that that truth right here lays the absolute foundation for every page of every word throughout the scripture. And why did he lay that out there? Why does God put it out there in that way? It's because he wants you to be restored, to reveal, to partner with him. Um, a lot of times when we take a test, it is kind of a pass-fail thing, right? Or it's, you know, make more than 60% or 
65% or whatever the percentage is in order to fail. Otherwise, you've got to take the grade over again. And I want to warn you, this test is not here to prove to God how much you love Him or it's, it's not like St. Peter is going to meet you at the Golden Gates and when you get there, he says, okay, before you come in, fill in these blanks. Billy gave you a chance to do your homework ahead of time. It doesn't really work that way because the, the, the real core, if you're, if you're thinking that, that I'm saying you've got to earn your salvation, the core theological truth is by grace we are saved through faith. That is not of yourselves. It is the work of God. You have nothing to do with it. So we don't take test ourselves here to sort of prove to God that we got it. And this is not an intellectual exercise. But we are trying to grow up in our theological depth and understanding so that we can reveal Him more. If you're not standing on a, on a foundation of truth, I can promise you, your life, I mean, it's hard enough as it is, but your life will not make sense. You're building on the wrong wall. I'm giving you this test because I, I really don't want to just be a church that just says we feed people. I want you to feed yourself. I want you to, when you do leave, whether it's to Euphrata or to wherever, God has led you, called you to be, that all of a sudden you become a foundational person that's able to be used of God in every way, shape, or form. But you've got to base it on this. What are we building our lives on? I'm going to just kind of wrap this up in a simple fashion for me. I think in so many ways we tend to, as humanity, build our lives on unsustainable uh, society. Unsustainable truths. We believe our, we even build Christianity, I think, on Christian religious prosperity with the goal of a greater sense of prosperity. So, and it's a prosperity of a gospel that somehow doesn't translate on. And when we do that, you're not building on this. Because John chapter 6 down here said, you want to really be my disciple? It's not a prosperous life. It's one that gives it all away. And I want to, I want to build our lives on these theological truths because I want to make sure we understand who we're listening to. There's a lot of voices out there. You've heard me talk about this all year. In 2020 and 2021, the amplified number of voices that are out there are exponentially higher than ever before. And we always, when we hear all the other voices and the voice of truth, we overlook the voice. Unless you build your life here. I'm giving this all to you because I believe the term I used way back when is we tend to be reactionary. Why are we reactionary? It's because we haven't really understood where it's all going. If you don't understand the foundation of all things, you literally are going to be like Papa was a rolling stone and you're going to hang your hat wherever, whatever looks best at that moment in time. I think also we have short memories, which is why this brick down here is so critical. Remember, 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 remember. Never forget. We built a world on great values in Judeo, in our Western world, Judeo-Christian values, and many of us kind of constantly, and I understand why you would do this, but you're constantly saying, what we need to do is get back to Judeo-Christian values. No, what we need to get back to is this. This is not a society, this is you. When I started the year, I read this verse, which I want to read part of it to you. 2 Timothy 4, I want to write that reference down, but in the presence of God, 2 Timothy 4, 1 and 5, it says, in the presence of God uh, and Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, in view of His appearing in His kingdom, I give you this charge, preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, and encourage, and with great patience and careful instructions, for a time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine, instead to suit their own desires, they gather around them a great number of teachers to say whatever their itching ears want to hear. And it just goes on. We live in a world that truly wants to listen to everything except the truth. And why do they do that? It's because the people of God struggle with standing on the real truth. There's a lot of questions I have about this world, but I don't have any questions about this stuff. There's a lot of nuances of the pieces here that I don't fully quite grasp, which is why I spend the rest of my life, and you need to too, 
growing in your understanding of that, but this is truth. All other stuff is just rumor. All other stuff is just kind of nuances and pieces of stuff. We base our life on grace saved by God, but we grow in a firm foundation to be used by God in every way to a broken world. And the real test is not just the written exam that I'm asking you to take, all of you. And frankly, even if you're online, and even if you're not a member of our church or you're maybe from somewhere else, I challenge you, pull down and download that document or put the UR code on there, download it, and play with that a while. Not just play with it. Study your way through this again. Sit down with somebody else and say, what does this word mean? How does it apply? And what does it change about my worldview and God's use of me in this limited time in my life? The real test is not a written exam. The real test is life. It's when you find out that your spouse has cancer. It's when you find out that you, know, you lost your job. It's when you find out that some of the security issues that you thought you had, that you were really basing your foundation of security on, is kind of gone for whatever reason. Because life does that. And something else hits and breaks down the walls of your life. The real test is life. And ladies and gentlemen, I really boys and girls, teenagers included. I, I pray that we teach this to our children. That's what the Bible tells us to do. I pray that we teach this to our teenagers. And I pray that we're teaching it to every adult, young or old, whether you be 90 or whether you be 19. This will transform you.